and uh, but uh, but uh, uh, with uh, a bureaucratic institution. And so I start to participate in some of these discussions. And last time uh, we discussed in Prague that uh, uh, there was no one covering the election in the region. So my presentation is going to be a bit different. I have two intentions with that. The first one is to uh, show where we are. And so I'm moving now from Europe to uh, Latin America. And the second one, a picture, a very general picture of uh, how the situation is in Latin America in terms of uh, uh, vulnerability. That would uh, so. Well, yeah. yeah. So we we'll talk about the location, then the objectives of the institution uh, we established there, and uh, some uh, uh, extreme events. I mean, the past is historical data. Yeah. On Latin American Caribbean, and then the way forward. We are located uh, uh, here. Uh, uh, Latin America is. Uh, as for those who are not completely familiar, we are yeah. uh, there's uh, 33 countries plus 13 uh, non-independent uh, territories. It's about 600 million people with per capita real per capita income of uh, slightly over 5,000 as an average, and. Uh, and we are located uh, in Brazil. It's about 35% of the population there. And uh, more specifically uh, in this, there's one point which I would like to say. I mean, there are, based on our preliminary assessment, uh, we have about 12 institutions, at least dealing uh, with uh, system analysis and complexity science uh, in the region. And uh, you can see those that uh, essentially they are located uh, at least three in Brazil, at least two here in Argentina, two in Chile, uh, two in Colombia, and at least two in Mexico. And uh, so we are located, uh, that's Brazil, uh, we are located in a region where we have 42% uh, of the population and responds to 52, 55% of the local GDP. And uh, here in this uh, state, uh, Sao Paulo states about 45 million people, 32% uh, of the Brazilian GDP. The three institutions I mentioned before, they are here, in exactly in the same location where you have the highest concentration in terms of population, and uh, our institution is located here. Yeah. Now it's a small <coughs> city for our standards, <coughs> 660,000 people, but we have to be careful with that because I, I had uh, uh, friends in, in, in one a, a special a special friend in Sweden and he said oh sir 600,000 it's the size of our largest the second largest city so we have to be careful when we say that but the city is focused on education biomedical <coughs> and industries and CC <coughs> so here's a, a fairly urban uh, developed area but uh, the most important uh, activities are are education biomedical and some agri industries which is important points just to give an, an idea of what uh, we are doing that. Now, we work with uh, three main objectives, our institution there. Uh, the first one is resilience of countries. We are focusing the region, but not only concentrating the region, and the uh, resilience of productive sectors using a system analysis perspective. That's what we do there. And uh, the second one is the role of science and technology. So uh, in several occasions when I was discussing this within the UN system, and they say, what, where, what is the institution? I used to work with the institution responsible or the agency responsible for transferring knowledge or promoting industrial development. And they say, what, what, what is the, the reason of uh, carrying out this type of analysis? Uh, if, you, if the World Bank or IMF or even the Economist Intelligence uh, Unit does that, yeah? So essentially, uh, we include the role of science and technology in this exercise, and I'll show you briefly how we do that. And uh, we, it's technology transfers and engineering, of course. We go beyond just the traditional uh, monetary and, uh, and fiscal policies, yeah? And uh, so, and then applied mathematics. What we observed is that when you carry out this type of uh, uh, resilience of countries, etc., it comes as a consequence. You know where these sectors and regions with the highest probability, of course, even if you don't figure out the financial, economic, feasibility of those uh, actors, I mean, in, in, in that region. But then we have a, a very good indication. We apply this 
particularly in Northeast Asia, and this works uh, quite uh, quite well. And once you know this, uh, uh, the sector and regions with the highest probability of growth, then you can in, make a link with investment banks and pension funds. We believe that uh, the increase the rate of return of those investment banks and pension funds will be a breakthrough within the next years. That's essentially how uh, I mean we are uh, established. Yeah. Well, while our experience, we work with 15 areas of knowledge. I'm not going to enter into those details. And uh, as it has been pointed out, it's very dynamic. So we update this between 18 to 24 months. We go from aerospace up to robotics. And then we consider this, uh, uh, let's say, essential. You say, why 15 and not 10 and not 24? Yeah, essentially because uh, we think that uh, 15 is a reasonable number to discuss. Uh, we, we work with them uh, on, as I discussed briefly with Victor, uh, on an individual basis, but then the integration of, of those knowledge, uh, areas of knowledge, is, is usually uh, uh, something which we consider a, a major challenge. How we do then, and what we can offer then, uh, how to work with this. Uh, we, we did something quite interesting. We modeled technology transfer. We work with, uh, essentially, uh, one based on 1,500 projects that uh, we had access when I was working still with the uh, UN as the director of research. And we worked essentially with five variables, four uh, that I will show to you now plus time. And uh, usually what happens is you have one or different sources or you have uh, more than one source. You have the first level of absorption. You, have, you can have one uh, uh, institution there or more institutions uh, involved in the process. And uh, then you go to the second level of absorption. You have uh, the first one is usually an enterprise we identify uh, as a model and uh, that transfer to the same area of knowledge that, uh, uh, that enterprise is working. And then afterwards, you go to the dissemination. Uh, and uh, the dissemination is throughout the whole, uh, uh, let's say, country. Yeah. And uh, what we observed is that developing countries are very good in adapting uh, new technologies, uh, but not to, to putting them into widespread use. So they go uh, fairly well up to this point, but they don't uh, come to that. And then we think that if we manage to do so, uh, then it would be a, a very, uh, let's say, interesting contribution we can bring to us, to, to, to the society. Yeah. Now, uh, let's take a look on some, this is again, I repeat, this is historical data and uh, on Latin America and, and some extreme events there. Now, the consequence of a complex system, as we all know, it's unpredictable, uh, produce large events, they show robustness, emergence, and novelty. And what we did then, we uh, uh, concentrate on three aspects that would give uh, us an indication or an idea of what is happening, uh, environmental, uh, health, epidemics, and financial, political, economic. We took a look in Latin America, and for facilitating our analysis, we divide into two components, geopolitical and geophysical. And uh, what happened then is that uh, we saw already some geopolitical characteristics in the, I think in the first slides, within the first slides, but then uh, I'll go further in, in some of uh, these analysis. What we observe in the region is something very interesting. It's the population density, which is the 600 million people, is highly concentrated in the coasts. Yeah. So this is already an indication of uh, uh, let's say, some points or uh, aspects of vulnerability. But if we go one step further, and then you see that besides being concentrated in, uh, in the coasts, we, they are concentrated uh, in, in major uh, uh, cities, in large cities. And our colleagues from the UN did uh, something, uh, a sort of projection, and uh, they identified that uh, in, uh, there will be, in 2030, there will be according to their figures, yeah? 41 uh, mega cities in the world, and five would be in Latin America. I, and the Caribbean, yeah? I, I consider, I think they are missing one. They are missing Lima. Yeah. So it be all together, according to my figures, this comes to six uh, places. Yeah. Just to give an example, uh, in the same study, they identified that in the United States, there'll be two uh, mega cities. One is New York, here, where we are, and I mean, this region, and then the other one is Los Angeles. So, but uh, it's interesting to observe that uh, they are, there are experts in, in urban development here that uh, uh, might be interested in knowing this, 
a bit further. Let's take a look in epidemics. Yeah? I personally don't think epidemics, <coughs> sorry, this is a large, and uh, we don't need to enter into details there, but my, my point is about 5% where the evidence we have it's from uh, in about 500 years of, uh, of history. Uh, of course, I mean, this is not covered, not, not everything is there, but in these 500 years, we have uh, over 200 episodes, 23 episodes were in Latin America. And, uh, but out of these 23, 10 were worldwide. So in fact, we have a little bit more than 5%. So I personally don't think that uh, epidemics should be an issue based on historical evidences. Yeah, we always have to, to be careful with that. Now, if we take a look on financial crisis, then it becomes a little bit more uh, complicated. Yeah? So we took a look in this past 40 years of financial crisis. And uh, out of these eight financial crises, uh, there are uh, that have been registered clearly. Two of them were originated there. So we have about 25% in the, and uh, two of course, I mean, of this last financial crisis because, because of globalization, they are affecting uh, the division as well. For instance, this one in Asia, and then the last one in the United States affected. But then it becomes a bit more complicated yeah? because uh, one has to be a bit more careful with the financial crisis. Yeah. What is uh, of particular concern here in the region, I mean, in the region we are studying, is the market and export diversification. We put here, uh, this is data from us, where our uh, work, uh, the institution I was working with, the marked concentration, then this product concentration. The ideal situation would be this uh, corner of the chart. So you are not so much concentrated in one market, and you are not so much concentrated in one product. But you see, uh, Latin America, I mean, Central America is heavily concentrated in one uh, uh, market, which is probably uh, due to Mexico, and uh, concentrated in the, uh, in the north, northern part of the uh, continent and the Caribbeans are more or less in the middle, and South America is here, high, heavily concentrated in one product and a little bit more diversified in terms of uh, markets. So the idea then, if one has to do something, is to bring these three, uh, uh, let's say, places here to as close as possible to this part of the chart. And uh, so this is uh, one aspect. Yeah. Now, let's uh, take a look now and move from geopolitical and go to the geophysical. I'm not going to enter into details, just, just to illustrate uh, how the situation is, uh, the diversity of the situation, yeah, of the, 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 the region. Yeah. So just this picture is uh, showing the, how diverse this uh, uh, region is, with, of course, I mean, with uh, some of them or each of them with uh, its own problems and uh, challenges and uh, et cetera. But what is interesting to observe is that the most susceptible areas to any type of uh, let's say, extreme event and from the geopolitical perspective is uh, here. Yeah. So, and, and then we, now if we move there and then we, uh, uh, from there we, we can, we took a look in where the incidents or where the episodes happened within the last years and we have a situation and uh, first I would like to thank our colleagues from the U.S. Geo Geological Survey. We contact them and uh, they, they have a an excellent publication, then we, we had uh, several discussions. But uh, this work is based essentially on what they did there. And they worked with uh, uh, five, six uh, natural disasters, uh, fraud, volcanic movements, those that are listed here. And they took parameters from this EM uh, DAT, which is the International Disaster Database, uh, which is located in Brussels. And they consider a natural disaster uh, any of those individually or a combination of the 10 or more deaths, 100 plus people affected, or a call from the country from the international system or a national state of emergency. Yeah. And then we have a picture, which is, uh, again, uh, the idea is not to show you so many figures, but uh, to the, the rational behind the, uh, uh, this uh, exercise. We have here, uh, of course, with the, we took out of these 44 natural disasters that our colleagues collected or identified within the last uh, 100 years, we took 24 just to illustrate to you. And what we observed is that uh, the disaster per square kilometer uh, is, uh, which gives a completely, uh, completely different picture than a traditional disaster per country. Yeah? Because uh, the number of, uh, of uh, 
disaster per square kilometer gives you a, a little bit more uh, an idea of how vulnerable some uh, parts of the continent or that region are. And what is particularly interesting is that uh, uh, in, s in six of those occasions where the, there was a correlation and the causation between uh, disaster and consequences to the community is where the uh, population density was the highest. Yeah? And what it's interesting to observe again, all those uh, uh, countries or non-independent regions, they are uh, non-independent territories, they are uh, in the Caribbean, yeah? except uh, El Salvador and Costa Rica in Central America. So what uh, our colleagues uh, 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 from the US uh, geolog Geological Survey did was uh, very interesting because usually you say, well, a disaster uh, in Mexico, a disaster in a country like uh, Cuba or a disaster, no. They went uh, one step further, they identified uh, disasters uh, per district. So you have where the highest, uh, the strongest color is, is where the most, uh, the, the region or the part of the component of that uh, specific country or territory uh, uh, is affected most. So you see, you, then you can identify where the problems uh, are concentrated, yeah? So they, they did this for uh, Central America and Caribbean and also uh, for uh, Latin America. And uh, in this case of Latin America, in the South America, sorry. And uh, w again, you see where the highest uh, concentrations of uh, problems uh, uh, took place. And I personally think that uh, uh, one, there's one vulnerable area here, which is, uh, is, is the Panama uh, Canal. Yeah. Uh, besides the Panama Papers. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think that uh, uh, this, in this canal, at uh, uh, the transit, uh, it trans uh, the transit is about 400 million tons per year of goods. And uh, in the same uh, uh, exercise that uh, uh, the US Geological Survey carried out, they identified that there were three incidents of, uh, of course, I mean, this is a long, through a long time, uh, for a long period of time, yeah? And uh, of uh, large waves, almost tsunamis in this region. If there is one in this region, and then somehow this canal is blocked, then we may have a problem. Yeah? And, uh, or, I mean, not, to talk about uh, terrorist attack or whatever. I mean, this is this would be uh, completely affected, uh, uh, let's say, uh, just to give one example, yeah, to the not the extent. Of course, I mean, if we, all this exercise that we uh, uh, are doing there, and we did, is uh, the, the highest toll is human, human lives, yeah, human lives. So that's what we are concentrating. But uh, let's say, moving from a, on that perspective, uh, what we see is that, uh, when we have a problem in any of those uh, points that we discussed, some with the highest probability than others, uh, we are uh, having concrete chances of uh, disruption of production and, transport and transportation systems. As we all know, this is very well known to me. Now, if we go to the way forward, then uh, as you said in the beginning, if you're small, then we have to, the rule of the game is to be associated with something, yeah? to, to some good institutions already uh, involved. So we have many challenges, uh, but we have some positive perspective. So the first is to strengthen linkage with uh, some select institutions. We, uh, we, are, we have a close cooperation with MIT and one specific school at Harvard. We have a cooperation with, uh, there's a lady here from China, she knows very well, this developer research center of the state council. And, uh, and uh, I had the discussions with them, I know them very well. We work together with YASA and then hopefully with this global uh, X. The second step is to continue assessment of institutions with similar objectives and trying to carry out some uh, joint work. The one which we are doing is, uh, for instance, just an example, uh, we are taking the lessons from the environmental science and try to apply it to financial crisis. We think, this is we may be wrong, but we think that uh, the environmental science has evolved uh, uh, better than the analysis of financial crisis. So we, I mean, it's surprising to observe what, uh, I mean, I can give details to you later on, but we are carrying out a systematic work on that. And this next one is funding. Uh, we are, are doing some consultancy work, etc., for governments and for institutions, uh, not necessarily government. And uh, uh, we established an investment fund, of course, in the beginning, but then 
the idea is that, that this would evolve to a uh, little bit more. So um, again, that's all I had to tell you. I mean, if those that want to enter into the details of some points that I mentioned there, uh, please just let me know. We can discuss it. So thank you very much.